The following is a Comfortably Zoned Radio Network production. Okay, welcome back to the uh, Retro Rangers podcast. I'm George Graham, and I'm here with former uh, Associated Press sports writer and author of many books on many sports, Hal Bach. We're joined this evening by by author... uh, Jay Moran, Jay Moran, who wrote a book called uh, The Rain is the Bruins and the End of an Era. Now, we're going to be talking about the uh, the uh, Derek Sanderson fight in the 1970 playoffs and also the the uh, death of, of uh, Terry Sorchuk a few months later. Now, this all happened 50 years ago, if if you can believe that. 50 years have passed since this happened. So... Now, the 1970 playoffs, the uh, Rangers ended up in fourth place, um, and they were, and they had to play the uh, the uh, Bruins, who ended up in in uh, second place. Now, if you recall, the Rangers only made the playoffs because they uh, scored nine goals in the last game of the season to beat Montreal and edge themselves into the playoffs. Now, you would think that uh, after a game like that, they might enter the playoffs with a little bit of uh, momentum. And but you know this is the Rangers and you know you know uh, we don't uh, you know work that way. So um, <laughs> the Rangers lost the first two games in Boston, eight to two and five to three, and then they came home to play the Bruins for for uh, two games. Um, you want to pick it up, Jay? Oh yeah. Um, uh... Right early into the game, uh, about a minute and a half in, uh, there was a face-off, and uh, Ed Jockerman skated out and said something to Derek Sanderson. Puck was dropped, and immediately a big brawl started. Um, And uh, there were um, 132 penalty minutes in the first period alone. I mean this this game this right. this set all sorts of records. Um 174 total penalty minutes, uh 38 penalties. The game took over 3 hours to play. Uh and it took 19 uh 18 minutes to play the first 91 seconds of the game. Yeah. <laughs> Actually there's a picture of the uh, brawl uh um um you know that happened um, you know in the corner. Um uh, and it's yes, on the cover of my book, book, yeah. W book, mm-hmm. yeah. Okay. So I guess it comes down to uh, what did Sanderson say, and then uh, was this Eddie doing something to get the team motivated to, uh, you know, get them going? Um, when I interviewed Sanderson, he told me that uh, Jockman said, he, we're going to get you. You know, uh, and there's a bounty on your head. And uh, and I did a couple quick references. Hugh Delano wrote a book, uh, Eddie, A Goalie Story, and Sanderson claimed that uh, Eddie said, we're going to get you and put a bounty on your head. And Sanderson replied, uh, oh, uh, groovy, that's cool. Um Gerald Eskenazi, he wrote A Year on Ice, uh, right. said the same thing there. We're going to, he claims that Eddie said, we're going to get you, and Sanderson said, uh, that's cool. Um, and Did you ever talk to Jockerman about it? Did Jockerman confirm that? He, he, I talked to him, uh, but not for the book, and he, he just uh, – Almost said he couldn't remember, but he said, uh, keep your head up or something like that to him. Um, and uh, when I inter- when I interviewed Derek uh, for my book, he said that uh, uh, he made the whole thing up. The whole bounty thing was um, going back to 1965 when the Rangers played and uh, the Bruins and... Um, Teddy Green speared Phil Goyette, and uh, after the game, Stan Fischler interviewed uh, Jennings, and um, he got him to say that uh, Derek's an animal, there should be a bounty on his head. 
So, um, well, in uh, 2015, when I interviewed Sanderson, he, you know, the, um, you know, the whole thing was made up. He didn't, he didn't say any of that. He, he, he made it all up, and he said that he went down to the, um, the, um, um, you know, after, after the brawl, he was thrown out of the game. He went down to the uh, locker room, and the, the uh, reporters followed him along with Paul Anka. Somehow Paul Anka got in there. And, mm-hmm. um, and um, you know, with everyone around, you know, he, you know he, he had an audience, you know, so he made it up. And, that's the, and that, that was what, you know, went out for back there. It, it made headlines. Miss Anderson was a was a star back then, and um, he made that headlines, and that's how that blew up. Well, but yeah. he was he was a villain. He was a villain in the, in the uh, relationship between the Rangers and the Bruins. Oh, sure. uh, he was a, he was not uh, a favorite of any of the Rangers. So yeah. you know, it's entirely possible that they were going to target him. They had to do something. They're down two games in the playoffs. And uh, they had to win this third game, so they had to do something to fire the team up. And he was a mm-hmm. perfect target um, for the Rangers to go after because he was a villain. He was the, one of the bad guys, you know. Uh, Phil Esposito was a terrific goal scorer, but he wasn't hated the way Derek Sanderson was in my recollection. Oh no! So mm-hmm. I'm not surprised that that would have taken place that way. Yeah, he was also a very good, uh, very good on the face-offs and the penalty kill. So he was uh, very good for the Bruins in that respect. Yeah. No question. Yeah, he was, he, was a, he was a good hockey player. He oh, just yeah. had tendencies to do some dirty things. Yeah, he, uh, he had an from now and now and then. So that you know, yeah, he was a kind of a villainous character. Yeah. Mm. As as far as what was said. Um, I interviewed a handful of players that were on the ice for that. Arnie Brown, Eddie Westfall, Walt Kachuk, uh, Dallas Smith, Rick Smith, uh, and Bob Nevin. And basically all said they couldn't hear what was said or they didn't remember. Basically they were too far away. I think the consensus from other sources was that Eddie said, uh, you know, keep your head up or we're going to get you. And then uh, they swore at one another a couple of times. Um, the fight, uh, you know, I think definitely inspired the Rangers, but uh, the, uh, Arnie Brown hurt his knee and was never the same after that from that fight, right. and uh, he missed the next game. Um, what else well, from that fight? The Rangers won that game 4-3, and, uh, and they won the next game 4-2, so they went mm-hmm. back to Boston and tied 2-2. And then they lost the the, um, the fifth game, and they lost the sixth game. So for the fourth year in a row, they were they were out of the playoffs after the uh, opening round. Um, they wouldn't get past the first round until the year after when they beat the uh, Maple Leafs and they lost to Chicago. Mm-hmm. Well, you know, in those years, um, the, the league, first of all, there was a six-team league, and four teams would make the playoffs. The first four teams would make the playoffs. And my recollection of those times were that the Rangers and the Bruins were both tail enders, and they were yeah. both battling for the fourth place, for that fourth place spot to get into the playoffs. So that's mm-hmm. part of what the, I'm sure Jay would confirm. That's part of what the rivalry was built around because they oh, were always yes. at each other's throats for that last playoff spot. Yeah. And then they both started getting better at the same time, and you know went higher in the standings and. Uh... The rivalry intensified. Right. You know, right. I think the Bruins had a uh, maybe a few more rough characters on the team than uh, than the Rangers did. Yeah, they had a good, good, uh, good uh, you know, up and down team. They, you know, they all played their uh, positions very well. After after the uh, Rangers series, the Bruins went on to beat Chicago. They uh, swept Chicago, and then they then they swept the uh, St. Louis Blues to win the cup, and that was mm. the. Uh, the goal where where uh, Bobby Orr was flying through the air over Glenn Hall after he got bumped by uh, Noel Picard, I think. Yeah, Noel and, Picard. Uh, yeah. Oh. Um. 
this that series also marked um, the last of uh, Terry Sawchuk's uh, career. In fact, um, in uh, in your book um, Guardians of the Gold, the picture that I gave you of Sawchuk, that's from his last game that he ever played. Yeah, it, it was in that series. Yeah, you know, there's another a... irony of. Uh, uh, let me before we go to get into Sawchuk, uh, go back to Sanderson. As hated as he was, A, by the Rangers, and B, by the Ranger fans, he wound up playing for the Rangers in 1974. Yeah. And, mm-hmm. he, year, and he had a pretty he, good he year. Played. He scored 25 he, goals. Yeah, 25, so 25, I, I find that very, very ironic, you know. Yeah. 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 Well, and, uh, no, Francis and, had a lot of respect for him. He he really yeah. appreciated his skills, especially yeah. on face-offs. Yeah. And then when Derek yeah. uh, did get to New York, he talked to someone like, Kachuk and uh, you know they both had hated hated each other on the other on the other teams, but you know they both said, "Hey, we're on the same team now, so all's good." <laughs> yeah. Well, in uh, in uh, in uh, 2017, when I interviewed him, uh, you know he was really a nice guy. He gave me, you know, a lot of the time. He 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 was humble and honest. He was a he was a really good interview, you know. I was so, mm-hmm. you know, and you know, um, you know, all those years that he was, um, um, you know, up there. You know, I really hated the guy, you know, when he was, um, you know, with the Bruins. But uh, he he was really a, a fantastic interview. So. Oh yeah, I, I, I found that them. true too. I remember one time though he. Uh, he in this fight, he was upset that uh, uh, he didn't take out someone better, uh, you know, as far as game misconduct. He was he wanted uh, Park or uh, you know somebody else, and uh, I think Belon went out. Yeah, I think he ended up taking up uh, Dave Belon. So. I can't remember which, uh, but I think it was later on, maybe the '72 series, that uh, he got into a fight with. Uh, Jill Bear and uh Jill Bear got thrown out and he was happy he took out someone of that quality, you know, yeah, quality. Yeah. yeah. Hmm. Well, he was an instigator, that's another thing. Yes. And yes, you know, definitely. Rod uh Rod was not a fighter. <laughs> Rod uh, Rod played his position, scored a lot of goals and stayed out of trouble. But uh Sanderson was an instigator and and that was a lot a lot of the games in those days Guys would target the best player on the other team and try to take him out, uh, which made a lot of sense. And strategically, that made a lot of sense. And mm-hmm. and so uh, Rod had a had a, a job staying out of trouble because often other teams would go after him, uh, knowing that he was the the best scorer on the ice for the Rangers. Well, like Montreal yeah. always used to send uh, send uh, John Ferguson out after him. Mm-hmm. And, uh, That's right. He was That's a right. big tough fighter, you know. He, he, He's a good player, but he was a big, tough fighter. And, you know, yeah. He'll be able to handle that. I asked Sanderson, well, why didn't you go after someone like Rattel, who had, you know, he was a very good scorer. And he said, well, there's not like no honor in taking someone out. He's a gentleman. You know, there's, you get no points for trying to pick a fight with him. Uh, and I always wondered, well, how did Rattel come up? And he never fought. I don't, I'm, you know, you could probably, I don't think he had any majors, but um, no. when you're first coming up, you're going to be tested, definitely. Yeah. And unless you had a reputation, maybe in the minors for never fighting, but, you know, why didn't not only Sanderson, but other players, knowing the skills of a Rattel, try to get into fights with him, but he never fought? It can't just be that, uh, well, you know, he's he's a gentleman. We don't play that way. You don't get points you know, for fighting a person like that. Yeah. Well, they had respect for him, you know, like you said, but mm-hmm. uh, it's true. I don't, you know, you have to, you know, wonder what happened there. Well, you know, he had uh, Vic Hatfield on his line towards the, you know, towards the uh, uh, you know, 60s there, but when he came up earlier, he was on the line with uh, Camille Henry and Roger Bear. So, you know, who's going to protect him mm-hmm. there, you know? You know, yeah, that's why I had feel is added to the line a little more muscle. He was, yeah. you know, Vic was a fighter, especially early in, in his career there. Yeah. Um, uh, Rangers had Curtin back. Yeah, 
Yeah. Um, he was uh he was a presence. So yeah. they didn't have a lot of fighters, but they had some big guys, Teddy Irvin, you know, yeah. some Irvin, yeah. Um Yeah, Hatfield Hatfield probably uh you know, saved him from from a lot too cause Well, they, when was, they got that, Ted Irvin, that, they got him in a trade for Camille Henry. And no, that was the, uh, first of all, Cammy was wrong. a tremendous favorite here in New York, and the deal was made because Camille Henry was about five foot ten, and Ted Irvin was about six foot three, and Emil yeah. wanted more muscle. He wanted the guys to be bigger, his team to be bigger, and that that trade uh, really raised a ruckus uh, because Camille was such a f- popular player here in New York. Yeah, and was Irvin was time. kind of a non-entity, pretty much. But uh, yeah. you know, it's a strange game sometimes. Yeah. Mm-hmm. So, so that brings us to to uh, Terry Sawchuk. Now, uh, now uh, Sawchuk was uh, you know one of the best goalies in NHL history uh, of his time. He he played for uh, 21 seasons. He won four Stanley Cups, four uh, Vezina trophies. He was a seven-time All-Star, and he's in the Hockey Hall of Fame. So, but in and he has uh, 103 regular season shutouts. That's that's amazing. Um, so he um, the uh, spring of 1969, the Rangers needed a backup goalie. They had been using uh, Don Simmons, and Simmons retired. And um, Emil wanted someone who would just be able to play, you know, half a dozen games, maybe eight games, ten games. And, you know, Storchuk was the best uh, one out there. So he was 40 years old, and the Rangers got him. And Emil was uh, was uh, surprised when he was in camp because when he played, uh, you know, he was like uh, – you know, 220 pounds early earlier in his career. Mm. But when he came to the Rangers, he was he was uh, he was 180. So you yeah. know, was really shocked at his uh, his appearance. But he he uh, did what he was asked to do. He played in eight regular season games. He went three one and two. He, uh, he uh, um, his uh, his uh, his 103rd shutout came on February 1st. Uh, 1970 at the Garden, uh, and that was the same place that in 1950 that he actually uh, recorded his his um, his uh, you know, shutout uh, in his rookie year uh, uh, against the Rangers. So, um, and then after this, uh, you know, after the Rangers lost to the Bruins, um, Sochak had been rooming with uh, Ron Stewart. And they were old uh, teammates from uh, the Maple Leafs, and they both um, liked to drink, and they both uh, sometimes got in, into trouble when they drank. And um, they were in a bar drinking, and they they had an argument about you know cleaning up the uh, rental house that they had, who you know, who owed who money, and who had to clean this and clean that, and uh, the uh, the uh, bartender threw them out of the the bar, and they 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 uh, fought outside the bar, and then the bartender sent them home. So they uh, each got into their own cars and drove home, which is not good. But mm-hmm. um, and then you know they went home, and 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 uh, on their front lawn they had a a fight. They were you know, pushing and shoving each other, and Sawchuck fell on either a um, a, a barbecue pit or on uh, on. A, his knee, and he ended up with a uh, uh, ruptured spleen and a um, and a torn liver. So um, he was in bad shape. He was in the hospital for uh, quite a while. And um, yeah, they had to do a couple operations. Yeah. So and um, he. Uh, he uh, passed away about three weeks later on uh, March uh, on May 29th, and uh, Emil had to come back from a from a uh, scouting trip and uh, claim his body from the morgue in uh, in uh, New York City. And uh, mm-hmm. it was a sad day for for the Rangers and, and for hockey and you know. It's a bizarre way for a an all-time great 
uh, for his career and his life to end. I mean, yeah. you know, Terry Sawchuk is right up there with the Plant and Glenn Hall and, and all of those yeah. legendary goaltenders of the 60s. Yeah. And for him to die in that bizarre, really bizarre, that's the only word I can think of, uh, yeah. in, in that bizarre fashion, uh, kind of mm-hmm. strange, really is, you know. Yeah, and the Rangers were accused of covering it up because they didn't let the press know that he was in the hospital, but the real reason was they were trying to get in touch with uh, Sawchuk's father to let him know what had happened. That's why the press was kept out of it for a while. Yeah. Um, That brought in an incident, too, where um, um, Stan Fischler's uh, wife, Shirley, uh, got an interview with Sawchuk, and um, she never said she was a reporter. And uh, right, right. and he was he did say well, we were just horsing around. It was an accident. It was nobody's fault. But uh, that got uh, Emil Francis very mad, and uh, he took away her credentials. And uh, eventually, yeah, there was, she... there was uh, bad blood between uh, Emil and 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 the Fisher for a long time from that. Mm-hmm. Well, it was bad blood between the Rangers and Fischler. I remember yeah. Muzz Patrick, uh, really, when Muzz was the general manager, uh, really got into it with Fischler. I saw it happen. Uh, Fischler mm-hmm. was a gadfly. Uh, he uh, he liked to uh, stir things up, and uh, that caused some some friction between him and the organization. And uh, so it was not surprising to me that Shirley Fischler, his wife, would sneak into the room you know, that's not exactly journalistic ethics uh, to pull a stunt right. like that. Mm-hmm. And uh, so I wasn't amazed at it, really. Yeah. yeah. And I don't know if it was after that or before that, probably before, she was the first woman in the locker room, and uh, she won in court for that right. So it had to be before this incident, I would well, think. Well, I was yeah. directly involved in that affair. Hmm. I was the president of the Hockey Writers Association. And she applied for membership. And I said, wait a minute, because your husband is a hockey writer, that doesn't make you a hockey writer. She had (laughs) zero credentials as far as I was concerned. And that got into kind of a messy uh, 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 argument between our organization and the Fishless. And I wound up one day at the AP, I was working at the AP, and I was served with a summons to appear before the, I guess, the Human Rights Commission or some, something like that. And hmm. uh, it happened that my boss was walking by when they served me with the summons, and he kind of looked at me like, what? What is going on? I didn't <laughs> need that, really, in my career. Uh, wow. But um, So that was a very messy time between the Fishlers and the, and the Rangers and the hockey writers um, hmm. because I, I questioned her uh Credentials, you, you know, you're married to a hockey writer. Thank God you're not married to a brain surgeon, or you'd think you were a brain surgeon. <laughs> you know, it's uh, you've yeah. got to establish yeah. yourself before you can be accepted into our organization. Well, right. she wound up being in the organization. Uh, uh, Bill Jennings really uh, had a uh, major role in uh, settling that little argument. And he said, he came to me and he said, "Look, let her in, and that'll settle it. It's uh, foolish to." carry on this way and so uh, that's that was the background of of her becoming a hockey writer uh but uh, you know <laughs> i just found it uh bizarre again and i use the same word bizarre that uh, this kind of an argument should take place i mean what makes you a hockey hmm. writer if you write <laughs> hockey yeah. then you're a hockey writer well right. don't uh. come to me and tell me you're a hockey writer when you've never written any hockey that was mm. my argument. So. And Stan was uh, critical of uh, Sawchuck uh, being on the team only to the point that he was thinking Francis was remembering his glory years and the man was actually uh, a little, you know, over the hill to be playing. Uh, and, um, I mean, they had Villemure in the minors and uh, Villemure thought he was going to be brought up until they traded uh or they acquired uh, Sawchuck. Um, yeah, well, I think I think Francis knew that Eddie was going to play most of the games, and he didn't want Jules sitting on the bench. 
He did bring yes, him up the yeah. next year, and and uh, and uh, that was when they won the uh, the uh, Vezina uh, together. Mm-hmm. So uh, Fields is a you know very good goalie. But uh, oh yeah, yeah. At, at but what time, surprised me was um, uh, Francis told me that he was going to bring Sawchuk back for one more year. I said, really? You know, really? because yeah, uh, when I interviewed him, it's in the book, and uh, that that surprised me because uh, I thought you know he knew. And people were trying to get the Rangers to trade uh, Villemur to them because they knew how good Villemur was. And uh, yeah, he was the hmm. best goalie outside the NHL. Mm-hmm. <laughs> so. And as far as uh, the other person involved in the Sawchuk uh, affair, that was uh, that was uh, uh, Ron Stewart. He was brought up on charges, but they, uh, you know, he was cleared. The Rangers got him a lawyer. And he was cleared, and um, Amor brought him back for another season or two, and he actually ended up coaching the Rangers in mm-hmm. 1975. That was Amor's last hire as coach. So, uh, um, you know, they didn't hold it uh, against him or anything. It, you know, they realized it was no, no. So, but um, yeah, it's a shame. It's. Um, you know, that, and you know, you know I, I mentioned happens. earlier the the irony of uh, of Derek Sanderson winding up playing in Ranger Blue uh, that one season, but they they also made the big trade. Uh, uh, Jay mentioned uh, Jean Rattel. Rattel wound up in Boston along with Brad Park, and the Rangers got Phil Esposito, who at that time was probably the the biggest name in the league because of his yeah. goal scoring uh, ability. And Carol mm-hmm. Vadney yeah. in, uh, in that trade, and uh, that really broke up broke up that old gang of mine, really, uh, because yeah. shortly thereafter uh, Eddie Jockerman wound up playing for the Detroit Red Wings. So yeah. Emil had made the decision to to break up the team that had uh, done very well for many years, but had not brought home the Stanley Cup, which yeah. was of course yeah. the ultimate goal. But yeah, it was ironic that, mm-hmm. that the Bruins would send. Phil Esposito and Carol Vadney to New York, and the Rangers would send Brad Park and Sean Rattel. These are these were guys who were not just uh, also Rens on the roster. These were the stars of the team, both teams. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. So it was a it was a blockbuster trade. I had seen yeah, very... that Harry Tindon wanted to send uh, I think uh, I think uh, Dallas Smith with Espo, but uh, Francis didn't want Smith, so he he brought uh, Vadney over. And Vadney, mm-hmm, yeah. and supposedly Vadney had it in his contract that he wouldn't get traded, you know, um, you know, after, you know, um, you know, like uh, in in uh, in October, you know, November, something like that, you know, uh, uh, only after the season. And so he he uh, held out for more money because you know they traded him, you know, and he had to move his family and everything. So he 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 uh, held out for more money. So and you know they. Got it. So. And Rattel had a very good career in Boston. Um, yeah. I, I don't. It, it actually extended his career. He had considered uh, retiring at some point, but um, he, he played almost. I think up until 1980, 81, maybe. So he. And I think he uh, saved the organization afterwards too. He worked mm, in the front yeah. office. Yeah, yeah. And I think Brad Park played more games with Bruins than than the Rangers. Is that right? Uh, yeah. Uh, I think so, yeah. Yeah. Not many, but he did. So I think that might be one of the reasons why they haven't, you know, hung his number up. But uh, um, I don't know. I, I think he should have his number retired. He's Brad Park. He's the best best uh, defenseman we had back then. He was our Bobby Orr, you know? That's right. That's uh, right. He was. And, he was. Uh, he wasn't Bobby Orr, but he was, you know, as you know, pretty close to it, you know. And, uh, so did he play with Orr in Boston? I think uh, for four games. Yeah. yeah four games? Sure. Yeah. That's it, and then and Orr's knee was so bad that, you know. And then Orr ended up in Chicago. How did that happen? Mm-hmm. Orr, Orr played in Chicago briefly. Yeah. But he I was done. Eagles, You're right, the knees uh, gave out on him. Yeah. I yeah. I think uh, Alan Eagleson arranged some kind of deal when he went to Chicago. And uh, or didn't want to go or something, but uh, yeah. yeah, I don't remember the details now. But um, 
you know, as bad as the Rattel trade was, I hated that trade. You know, in 76, they traded Rick Middleton for Ken Hodge. <laughs> uh, yes, and uh, yeah, I guess Esposito, Esposito wanted his old buddy back, but he was a little over the hill then, and Middleton went on to, you know, how many goals did he score? It's like, ugh. Well, uh, the uh, reason that uh, John Ferguson gave was that they wanted to get uh, uh, Middleton away from the New York uh, nightlife. And I think Walt McPeak said, um, he wondered uh, out loud if, if they didn't have uh, bars up in Boston. So, um, <laughs> so uh, yeah. that's that's supposedly why they got rid of Middleton. But yeah, he would have been a, he would have been fantastic down here. But uh, we got Ken Hodge, and Hodge played maybe a season and a half. Um, Hodge was part mm. of the uh, great right wing. Uh, purge the following year when they got rid of uh, uh, Hodge and Bill Goldsworthy and uh, Roger Bear uh, right before mm. uh, Thanksgiving, and uh, that was John Ferguson. So, and then uh, I think that was the end of Ferguson too. So, yeah, you know these are these are major transactions that were made in those days, and you don't see any of that today. Uh, I I mean I'm not as close to the game as I once was. But it doesn't. It seems to me that you don't have those kind of trades anymore. I mean, am I right or wrong? No, you're right. Well, right. You got um, salary cap. You got salary caps. You got uh, no trade contracts. You got you got um, uh, you know, contracts where the guy can say, you know, uh, you, know uh, um, you know, I don't want to go to uh, Los Angeles. I don't want to go to Chicago. You know, so mm, uh, sure. That sure. Happens. So, um, and yet. To trade these guys. Yeah, it, it is hard, harder, and yet there seems to be more turnover. Not major trades, but more turnover. I mean, the teams back in the 60s and 70s, all the teams didn't change their rosters much around. And, uh, you know, nowadays it's much more fluid, but you're right. Like the big name for big name, it's, it's not as common. Um, getting back to Terry Sawchuk for a minute, I wonder how today's players, how much they know their history. Um, you know, they might I remember. Not at all. I would guess yeah. not at all. The, yeah, the it, athletes it, that like, I've talked to, the athletes that I've talked to over the years have very little appreciation of the history of the game. And I'll hmm. take you for a moment to baseball. Uh, when the, uh, the New York Mets acquired Vince Coleman, who was a, uh, terrific base stealer with the Cardinals, and they came mm-hmm. to the Mets, and he was in spring training, and we uh, went up to talk to him, and they were getting ready to celebrate Jackie Robinson Day, which they do every year in April, to mark mm-hmm. Robinson's debut with the Dodgers. And so we went up to Vince Coleman, who was a black player, and we said, uh, what do you think about Jackie Robinson Day? And Coleman said he had never heard of Jackie Robinson. So, who is Jackie mm-hmm. Robinson? Well, I mean, now we have a real problem here, you know? Yeah. yeah. So I, yeah. I think in general, I don't think the players of today uh, have any appreciation for or interest in what went before. They're only interested in themselves and what's going on right now. That's mm-hmm. my experience. Yeah. Why do you think that is? Because they don't they don't read about the game. They don't they don't care about. I, know, I think what they're happened. so involved in playing the game from a young age that. Yeah. The history of the game is lost upon them and, and of very little interest to them. It's almost like yeah. the game started when they came along, you know? Yeah, yeah. Well, but, when they're growing up and they're young, they would have a, a poster of someone, you know, on their wall, which they had to be active. So, you know, whoever they modeled themselves after or whatever or who followed as a fan – uh, they're not going to go back and put, say, Tony Esposito on their poster, you know, on, their, on their wall, because that's a couple of generations back. So, you know, I could see a little of that with the with the younger players. Or, you know, all so many games are available now with cable. You could see so many teams back then. You didn't see many many teams unless you know. Well, I would think that a young goaltender coming up today, number one, has never heard of Terry Sawchuk. Mm, and, I'd and agree. Uh, or or Tony Esposito, uh, he may have heard of Martin Bardur of the Devils, yeah. because exactly, Bardur yeah. was such a great goalie, yeah, and he's yeah. of the modern generation. But I think mm-hmm. the older player, I mean, there were there were 
goalies when in the six team league that were unbelievably great. You talk about Glenn Hall of the Blackhawks, you talk mm-hmm. about Sorchuk, you talk about Jacques Plant with the Canadians. I mean, these were all time all timers. And uh, mm-hmm. their their names are lost in the annals of history uh to these modern players. I, I that's what I believe. Mm. Yeah, but you know, uh, those uh those uh, six teams. Yeah, Glenn Hall in Chicago, uh, uh Plant in Montreal, uh, Bauer in Toronto, Sorchuk in Detroit, and Gump Worsley in Bo- in, uh, in in uh, in the uh, Rangers. Here, all those guys are in the Hall of Fame. The only mm-hmm. guy who's not and in justifiably. the Hall of Fame as a goalie, yeah, the only guy who's not in the Hall of Fame as as a goalie is uh, is uh, Eddie Johnston from uh, Boston, and I think he mm-hmm. might be in as a as a builder or something. I don't think you know not as a player, but uh, mm-hmm. they're all in the Hall of Fame. So, and I wonder if the uh, I wonder if the Canadian players have a better sense of history. Like a, you say, a Ken Dryden, I'm sure they would, you know, remember him. I think um, you're probably right. I think you're probably right uh, mm. because that's their sport. It's the national game in Canada. Right. Uh, in mm. the United States, and I and I worked hard alongside other people trying to improve it. But in the United States, hockey has always been number four. You had football, right. baseball, basketball, and then you had hockey. And, right. Uh, I mean, I loved the game, and I loved it when I worked in it. I loved it when I covered it. But you never could make a, a, a foothold. You couldn't get a foothold uh, in this country, largely because there were no American players. Now, of course, there are American players today, but we're talking about 50 years ago. There were no American players. There was, I think, Tom mm-hmm. Williams who played for the Tom Bruins. Williams. Uh, but other than that, there were no Americans, and it's it was hard, I think, for the American sports fan to buy into a game being played by what amounted to foreigners, Canadians. Yeah. Uh, but you know, you had to put that aside and to just appreciate the game for what it was. And in my opinion, which counts for nothing. Uh, <laughs> The game was a hell of a lot better in those days than it is today. Uh, I know that the players are bigger and stronger and faster and so forth and so on, but I think the game, uh, for me, uh, the game was more exciting in those days. Uh, There was more drama in the games. I don't know. That's just the way I feel. Um, Hmm. It was more wide open, I think. Yes, uh, I think that's part of it. You had more breakaways. You had more... More uh, more than ones now. Now everybody's uh, you know um, everyone's uh, in the slot trying to you know clog things up and you know uh, you know around the net and there's just no there's just no open play anymore. You know. Well, you couldn't stand in front of the net back then without being uh, you know <laughs> pushed around at least a little bit. You know, there was yeah. now you can't touch anyone in the slot, so it's like. Mm. But uh, you know, as far as the uh, the uh, the players from Montreal having their having their past in front of them, um, they have a a, a poster uh, that's over their lockers that says something like, "To you with failing hands, we pass the torch." And they have uh, all these all these pictures of all the Hall of Famers, you know, in the locker room, you know. Well, I got to tell you, I just I just wrote this for a a publication that the AP uh, circulates to its retired people. I was covering the playoffs in Montreal one year. You know, they say there were ghosts. There were ghosts in the in the forum, in the Montreal forum. Howie Morenz and that crowd. So anyway, Mm -hmm. I was covering the playoffs one year in the Montreal forum, and when you work for the AP, there's a lot of work to be done, and uh, it's not just one story. You're writing a lot of stories, and I was flying solo. I was working up by myself, and I'm writing, and I'm writing, and I'm writing, and I finish up, and I become aware of the fact that there's nobody else left in the press box except yours truly. <laughs> well, that's okay. I'm done. I'm Now I'm going to go back to my hotel. And I leave the press box, and I go down to the entrance to the building, and it's locked. I'm <laughs> locked in the Montreal Forum with all these ghosts. <laughs> wow. <You> know, <laughs> I... Now I'm thinking to myself, what do I do now? Well, I found my way to the warehouse uh, door, the, the one of the back doors of the forum, 
and there was an old French Canadian uh, watchman. You now I took four years of high school French, not for nothing. So I walked up to him and I said to him, "S'il vous plaît, ouvrez la porte." And he looked at me and he laughed. That means, please open the door. <laughs> he he laughed and he opened the door for me and I got out and I said merci, which is thank you, and I went on my way. But that's one of my favorite adventures as covering and covering hockey at the Associated Press. <laughs> Lucky guy. That, that's, yeah, um, that's right. <laughs> yeah. Were you able to see uh, Sawchuck in person ever? Uh, me? Yeah, I mm. I saw him when he played for the Red Wings. Sure. Mm, okay. I yeah. The Rangers, but, uh, Not a lot. I mean, but I did see him play. There's no question. Yeah. Uh, mm-hmm. My recollection of the Red Wings goalie is Roger Crozier. Mm. Yes. You know, but uh, Terry was there when I first got there. I guess. Yeah, he played for uh, six teams, I think, and uh, he played for Detroit and Boston, and uh, went back to the Red Wings, and then uh, Toronto, and he was LA. drafted by the Kings. I think yeah. he was the first goalie drafted in the '67 uh, uh, expansion draft. And then he went back to the Red Wings, and then th- then he came to the Rangers. So he got around. Mm. Um, he had trouble too. He he um, had a had a um, uh, you know, drinking problem. I think uh, at one point, and uh, he had uh, um, you know, trouble with uh, with uh, you know nerves and stuff at one point, and he, he had a breakdown when he was with the Bruins, and he missed most of his his uh, second season there. I think uh, Don Simmons took his place, and uh, then he went back to the Red Wings. So. But, not uh, not to mention all the injuries he took from not wearing a mask and <laughs> yeah well there's yeah. that one picture that you see on online once in a while I think it was on Sports yeah. Illustrated where they they have him all carved up in his face with all the all the all the all the you know uh, all the yeah it looks like he's wearing Jerry Cheever's mask yeah, yeah. <laughs> yes 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 <laughs> you know what I I believe those guys were nuts to play to play barefaced you know. Mm-hmm. You have to have an awful yeah. lot of courage. I'll say that. Yeah. yeah. Yep. And it was only <laughs> one goalie. They they had to play every game. They you know, that's that right. Was, that was right. in their job description. Play you know, uh, you know, play every game. It was very rare that you had you know two goalies playing for one team back then. They they. Um, well, every they team had an emergency goalie. If uh, <clears throat> if uh, the goaltender got hurt, the Rangers yeah, used yeah. a statistician named Joe Schaefer. Who sat hmm. in the press box praying that he didn't have to go on the ice, you know? Yeah. Um, but um, he he played some a little bit, and every team was required to have a uh, a substitute goalie. The Red Wings' backup goalie was the trainer, Lefty Wilson. Right. Oh, okay. Yeah, I've heard of him. Yeah. 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 Uh, I think different I think time. It was a different league. time. Yeah. There was. Yes. There was. It was. Uh, I think uh, two games where. Uh, where Worsley got hurt in the uh, in the uh, Olympia, and uh, the uh, trainers had to come in and and sub for him. One was uh, Danny Olesevich, and the other one I don't not remember his name, but um, they were like the um, you know the um, odd trainer, the extra trainer for the team back then. Well, we so, had this uh, story this year where the Zamboni driver yes. uh, took oh, over yeah. in Nets. That was earlier this season. So yeah, sometimes they even, things haven't changed all that much. No. Yeah. <laughs> I think they even gave him his own jersey with a number on it after the game. I think so. Know. I think so. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> because I, you know, I don't know what he was paid, but it, you know, probably, you know, wasn't that much. But uh, he he had a ball, you know, playing. He he won the game. He he uh, gave up his first two shots, but I think he he uh, stopped everything after that, and he won the game. So. And he goes into the record books one and zero. Yeah, that's yeah. it. Yeah, and, you know, he did something we would all like to do. You know, <laughs> I think so. I think so. Uh, <laughs> so, uh, so thank you for being on, both of you. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I hope everyone is is uh, is uh, safe and well. Everybody uh, wash their hands and don't touch your face and and uh, mm-hmm. and uh, keep That's it, it and keep wear a mask. Everybody like the goalies do. Yeah, wear yes, like your goalies, mask. Yeah. Yes, wear your mask. And <laughs> we'll be back with the Ranger uh, 
podcast soon. Thanks for having me on. Love talking to you, okay. ladies. <laughs> okay. All right. Good night, everybody. Thank yeah. you. Good night, everybody. Bye bye. The proceeding has been a comfortably zoned network production. You are advised to keep your dreams wet, your humor dry, your children and grandchildren out of military recruiting offices and off the laps of clerics who wear dresses. Thank you for listening, everyone. Happy trails.